Hey everybody, Rob Silverman here. We got about a five second delay. Sorry about that. It's just a little hard on the laptop. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Uh, really excited, as always, uh, to share some leading edge information. A lot of people have been asking me questions about the ketogenic diet. Uh, I've talked about it in passing. Today we're going to spend a lot of time on the ketogenic diet and the ketogenic diet for obesity and diabetes. There's a great article that came out in Nature. Um, I'll give you the full citation at the end. And in this article, really discuss keto's effect on obesity and overweight and non-diabetic uh, patients and diabetic patients. And I think you're really going to like the results. I want to put it in a context. I want to share the results with you. Then I want to share it in a context versus other diets. And at the very end, if I forget, Stephanie's going to remind me, I want to talk about the ketogenic diet with women and how women can get a better outcome because a lot of women have called me and said that the ketogenic diet wasn't for them. Now, having covered all that, let's explore the efficacy of the keto diet and its effect with different types of patients. So what they did was, as I just said earlier, they looked at overweight or obese patients. They also looked with and without diabetes type 2. So it's very interesting when they compared these subject groups. Um, remember, the keto is, uh, the macronutrients of the keto are very interesting. The, the whole, the sole purpose of the keto is to reduce insulin levels, to redirect lipid metabolism. So you want to metabolize fats instead of glucose. You want to use fats as your main source of energy. And you want to have what they call ketone bodies produced. And then you want to have ketone utilization. So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about what the ketogenic diet is. It's approximately 75% fat. 20% protein, and about 5% carbohydrates. You want to be under 50 grams of carbohydrates for the day, and a lot of the weight loss uh, benefits were shown previous to this study to be 25 grams or less. So you're not having a lot of carbohydrates. You're eating mostly fat and mostly proteins, and hopefully good fat. One caveat I'll say, they did not share that in the study. For me, I'm a big proponent of the clean versus the dirty keto. And what do I mean by the clean versus the dirty keto? The clean keto is no processed meats, grass-fed meats, the wild fish. I'm a non-dairy guy, so you have to lose the butter, but you can use clarified butter or ghee, which means that you cook it a little further along and you get the clarified butter, you melt it away, the milk solids and the ghee's just cooked a little longer, so you get the nutty taste from the butter. So I'm a big proponent of the clean versus the dirty keto. If anybody needs any information, I wrote a blog about that, I'm very happy to share that. So getting into the ketone bodies, you have three ketone bodies that you can make. The big ketone body that everybody talks about is beta-hydroxybutyrate. It's the gold medal winner. Actually, it's an uncoupling protein. And when you're running on fat, versus carbohydrates, you have a much better chance of utilizing higher quality fat and for longer periods of time. You know you only have about 2,000 calories stored of carbohydrates throughout the different storage depots in your body, whereas you have up to maybe 40,000 calories of stored fat in different uh, depots and reservoirs. So fat's a much better source of energy. It's 2.25 times more energetic so every gram of fat is much more energetic, over two times more energetic than carbohydrates. And if you can get to the point of ketone utilization, you're using a high, good quality fat. So I am a big proponent of the ketogenic diet. Some over, uh, views, uh, overarching themes of the ketogenic diet are very simply, keto is great for neurodegenerative disease. It's great for a concussion. And the ketogenic diet also has been shown to be good for things that we're talking about in the light of losing weight, blood sugar, and, and et cetera. So ketones and ketone bodies are good sources of energy. Do consider them. It's not the only diet. And I'm not saying stay on a diet forever. They're good sources of energy. The review consisted of 14 randomized controlled trials. Um, 734 people were either overweight or obese. 444 were diabetic patients and 290 were non-diabetic patients. So it's a substantial study, ample people. Um, they looked at one side and the other side. The primary lab assessments were very interesting in that the primary lab assessments actually looked at uh, fasting glucose. So fasting glucose is your glucose level right at that point. You know, it's that snapshot in time. 
hemoglobin A1C, which shows your average of your blood sugar over 90 to 120 days with an emphasis on the last 30 days, approximately 50% of that number is the last 30 days. It is truly the standard bearer to determine if you're diabetic or not. Um, fasting insulin. So what is your insulin being released when you're not eating? Excellent, excellent marker. Um, for me, glucose is important, but the insulin markers are even more important. C-peptides, checking if you have those C-peptides, and your cholesterol, your total cholesterol, your triglycerides, your LDL and HDL. Now, we all know that looking at these cholesterols are important. However, really, if I were to take a blood test, if you were to come in, I would really look at what we call the particle size of the HDL, the ALDL, and I would look at some um, equations with the total cholesterol. But these are starting markers. They are the standard bearer. They're not one that I recommend. I would recommend more invasive type of numbers. C-reactive protein really speaks to the idea of tissue inflammation. And you want to see if your tissues are inflamed. You would look at C-reactive protein, eight uh, HS, C-reactive protein, a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, really talks to artery damage and artery stiffness. And then you have your serum creatine. So that's a great choice. Um, they used a lot of different markers. They also collected, believe it or not, they looked at body weight. You know what? And body weight's a marker. We all know that it's all about body composition which they didn't do, but it, body weight is a marker. I mean, even if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger at 6'2", 235 in his heyday, and he's mostly muscle, virtually all muscle, tremendous amount of muscle, you still, there is maybe some strain on your body, but it is body composition. BMI, which is height overweight, I think it's a bit of an antiquated uh, number. Again, I like body composition, I like fat percentages, muscle percentages, the delineation, different quadrants and body parts of your uh, muscle, and of course, visceral fat, which is the most um, revealing number when it comes to fat because it's your most inflammatory fat. Waist circumference. Waist circumference is a critical element. I mean, you know, the bigger your waist, literature has shown that uh, the more um, unhealthy you could necessarily become if you don't lose that adipose tissue. And blood pressure. They're playing games with all the different blood pressures now. So many different numbers when it comes to blood pressure. But blood pressure is a critical element. We're looking at uh, diastolic and systolic blood pressure. Um, remember, for metabolic syndrome, it's 130 over 85. You go to the regular primary care, it's 120 over 80, and they really want it to drop more now. So, a couple other things. The effects of the keto on glycemic control over the 3 to 12 months. There are positive effects were greater in patients with diabetes than with a low-fat diet. So, essentially, the ketogenic diet did a great job on your glycemic control versus those in a low-fat diet. It makes, no, makes a lot of sense because if it's a low-fat, it's more of a high-carbohydrate diet. And it's pretty rare that I recommend at this point a high-carbohydrate diet. I'm more... Uh, higher fat or moderate fat, mix it with carbohydrates, what kind of carbs. Some of the things, I don't know that carbs are the culprit that sometimes we say, but man-made carbs, too much fruit, processed food, and all that. You know, if you're going to have a carbohydrate for some green vegetables, if you want to have a fruit once in a while, it's not going to be that easy to be in ketosis. However, that doesn't mean that it's unhealthy. If you told me you had an apple, it's great. If you told me you had 10 apples, I'd say it's too much. But getting back to the matter at hand, the effect of the keto and glycemic control over the three months with the glycemic index, this was demonstrated by a significant decrease in hemoglobin A1C. So for those diabetic, pre-diabetics, those diabetic type to metabolic syndrome, ketogenic diet is a consideration. I'm a big proponent of con, you know, con, looking at and evaluating the keto if it's right for you. Remember, you can always look at the genetics and determine if you're going to be able to uh, digest and assimilate efficiently saturated fats. HOMA, so that's another great uh, marker that I would look at. And uh, anything demonstrated for diabetic patients decreased with the ketogenic diet. It's one of the first studies that really looked at diabetics and non-diabetics. So this was quite um, revealing, if you will. So the keto diets, they, they studied the keto diet now between four and 12 months. It demonstrated significant reductions in weight in both diabetic and non-diabetic patients. So we know if you're on a keto and it's four months or longer, 
you're going to lose weight. Now, here's something that's interesting when we talk about diets. A study came out, just to segue into this, that if you to break a habit, I want to say it correctly, to break a habit, you had to practice that habit for 66 days in a row. So that's why you're seeing three and four months as the, as the baseline point, because otherwise no one's really broken a habit. So the keto diet on four to 12 months not only showed that the decrease in weight reduction and diabetic and non-diabetic patients, it also improved lipid profiles in diabetic patients, which showed an increase in HDL, HDL happy, should be high, good cholesterol, and a decrease in triglyceride levels, which are critical in that triglyceride levels are essentially blood fats. So as we move along keto diets, the essence or the takeaway in this particular study was the keto diet was effective for weight loss. So if you're looking to lose weight, consider the ketogenic diet. Caveat, make sure it's the clean keto instead of the dirty keto. Here's your problem, transitioning to the keto diet. That's the tough spot. So let's talk a little bit about that. A lot of people find that difficult and there's a couple of reasons why. When you cut all your carbohydrates out and you go to fat, your body hasn't transitioned to using or utilizing fat. Your central nervous system gets a little funky because it's got no energy for a little while. Having said that, that transition is tough and a lot of people complain on about day three of something called the keto flu. Now the keto flu is not a flu, it's a bad flu. You feel like crap. You without question feel like crap. In that feeling like crap, you're going to ache, you're going to have a headache. I've had people call me up and go, you know what, I am not happy on this thing. You and I are going to talk about it. So how do you avoid the ketogenic flu? Well, to the next statement that they said on keto diets, exogenous ketones are a valuable adjunct. You can put ketones, you can take medium trained triglycerides. Medium trained triglycerides, which come from coconut oil, will get you right into ketosis really quick. Piggybacking on that, you can also take what they call ketone salts, and in the salt, the salt is a, is a uh, transporter to get beta-hydroxybutyrate in there. The salt, interestingly enough, is also a critical element, because when you cut from carbs to fats, carbs enable you to hold on to water. So when you cut your carbs and go to fat, you get what they call a swoosh. All this water comes out, and in that water just gushing out, you losing water, part of the early weight loss you'll see in the keto is the loss of water, you're going to lose electrolytes. So that loss of electrolytes really emphasizes and really um, enables you, unfortunately, to feel the essence of that keto flu. So some of the recommendations are the salts with the MCT oil together because the salt not only just carries the exogenous ketones, the salt also is an electrolyte and you need it to actually hold on to a little water. So for me, I usually recommend as exogenous ketone both MCT oil and the ketone salt for multiple reasons. Now they talked about intermittent fasting also being extremely synergistic with the keto diet. I think it's an outstanding addendum and add to it. Now when I say in this that it's outstanding, let's talk about what intermittent fasting is. Now, I've talked about it before, but I just want to reiterate, intermittent fasting is technically, in the parlance, misused. It really means that you're going to fast for a day. What we really refer to in intermittent fasting, and we'll still call it intermittent fasting for this Facebook, is time-restrictive eating. Time-restrictive eating means that you're going to fast for a part of the day, and you're going to eat for a part of the day. So the numbers that come up in this time-restrictive eating slash intermittent fasting are 14 and 10. The first number refers to the idea of how long you're going to fast for. The second, so it's 14. The second number, 10, means the window in which you're going to eat. You get, once you get past 12 hours, so you get to hour 13, you get something that's called autophagy. It's called cell devouring. You eat your own cells. 2016, there was a Nobel Prize for autophagy. You eat your own cells, you have your energy, and you produce new enriched cells. So let's look at this as an example. I hope this is vivifying enough for you. Your body eats your old cell. Your old cell is old. It looks like a raisin. It's kind of crinkled up. It's doesn't have as much energy. It eats it and uses that energy to make new cells. That new cell looks like a grape bursting with energy, all that fluid. And that's kind of what it looks like. Not only is the cell rejuvenated through proper autophagy, it's also, if you will, immunorejuvenation, which means these cells have more immune functions. So 
when you really think about it, autophagy is a critical element for health. You get autophagy in the start of the fast in the day at hour 13. When you go to hour 15 or more, you get even more autophagy. So the first set of numbers to piggyback backwards is 14 and 10. There are a lot of people who do 16 hour fasts and eight hour eating. Now you've got a boatload of autophagy. So that 14 to 16 hour is fast is really a great time to do that. Some little caveats to that with the keto diet, make sure you have breakfast, skip dinner if you have to. Some people actually go to 18 and six. Personally, most people find an 18 hour fast in a six hour window, not that effective. However, autophagy, with intermittent fasting. Let me say that a little different. Intermittent fasting with the keto body produces more keto. Ke wow, Steph, stop laughing. It's been a long day for me. Intermittent fasting with a ketogenic diet enables you to produce more ketone bodies. So intermittent fasting, time-restricted eating is a great adjunct to it. So this information all came from a meta-analysis of a randomized controlled trial. The study, um, that was the study, the um, magazine, the periodicals, peer-reviewed its nutrients and came out on July 6th of 2020. Now, please, it's, we're at 16 minutes. I just want to tell everybody, like this, please share this. You guys have been doing a great job. We've got a lot of people watching. Share this, comment on it, follow me on some of my other um, uh, social media. Everything is Dr. Robert Silverman that counts. Now, there's something that I... Uh, seated at the beginning that I wanted to talk about now, and that was women on a ketogenic diet. So many women have come in and said, you know what, I've read a lot of good stuff about it, and a lot of good stuff about the ketogenic diet, but you know, as a female, it just doesn't work for me. And I'll be honest with you, initially, I was a little skeptical of that, but the literature really revealed that these women were correct. And the reason they were correct is, is that estrogen, so you've, we'll use broad, um, broad numbers, 15 to 50 um, year old women, their estrogen's elevated. Uh, you know, a, a menstruating uh, age of women from 15 to 50, their estrogen's elevated. And there was a study, they did it with mice. And what they found was that mice, uh, you know, um, I never knew mice had metabolic syndrome, but mice did not respond. Female mice during um, the birthing years for them did not respond well to the ketogenic diet. When they removed their ovaries, they responded well. So having read that, I said, let me apply this to humans. And I did with the women, so here's what I did. If you're a female between 50 and 50 and you wanna do the ketogenic diet and you want the ketogenic diet to be more efficient, in my office, I detox the women before and during the ketogenic diet. Why? Because your liver one of its main purposes is to detox exogenous extra estrogen. And by doing so, you are able to get all the benefits of the ketogenic diet. The men don't have to do that because obviously men aren't, or at least shouldn't be as high on estrogen. So my suggestion is really without question, if you're a female, please do me a favor and detox before and during you're using the ketogenic diet. Now, I wrote an article for Chiropractic Economics, and I'll have Stephanie um, put the link in so you can go to it. It's all about the estrogen and the ketogenic diet with the females, and um, it's been, you know, really response, responsive. People have been extremely responsive to that particular article. I don't see any questions right now, but I do see a lot of people on. So um, I just want to compare and contrast the keto from some of the other diets while we have so many people here. And what I wanted to say is there's a lot of other good diets. The keto is not the only diet. By the way, the keto is not a fad. The keto has been here since the 1930s. It was done initially for children with epilepsy. So as I said before, neurodegenerative disease is a great choice. In addition to that, you know, when you compare it to the Mediterranean diet, the Mediterranean diet is a great diet. just not going to get ketone bodies. So if you decide to go on a Mediterranean diet, that's fine. I would still take MCT oil because you can have that. I still may consider some salts once in a while. Ketone bodies are without question energy producing. The brain, and here's a takeaway, here's a gem for the day. Your brain functions much better on fat than it does carbohydrates. Because when you have too many carbohydrates, you get what we call diabetes type 3, which was Alzheimer's. So your brain doesn't like the sugar. Sugar is inflammatory. Good quality fats, not inflammatory. Want to make sure that that is uh, 
resonating with everybody who listens. As you all know, I'm always on uh, between 1 and 1.30. We try and do one, but as you can see, it's patient time, and sometimes patient needs a little more to help, a little more time. I do recommend a ketogenic diet in my office a lot. Um, I'm very uh, specific to individualize it for people's genetic potential. If anybody's interested in that, that the ketogenic diet is right for you, give us a call. We have a test so we can see nutrient optimization, so we can pinpoint it. And, and that's one thing I want to make clear. The keto is a great idea, but I want to make sure it's right for you. You know, a lot of people do diets and they find out that it doesn't work for them. And part of the reason it doesn't work for them, you're not optimizing your genetics. You're not optimizing what you are and who you are. So I have a different body type, a different genetic makeup than the guy next to me, if you will. So I'm always trying to look and optimize. And I've done the ketogenic diet, and it was very funny. Uh, my own personal experience was positive. I don't really need to lose any weight. I was looking to get healthier. I can always do better. I mean, that's my goal. I want tomorrow to be better than today for myself and all my patients. And one of the things that I always want to say it's something I say on every Facebook. I know people don't know where to go to trust. Please, you can trust me. I am going to be as transparent as I can. Anything you need, you let me know. Now that we threw that out there, um, I had to cut back on my fat. I actually had to eat some more carbohydrates because for me, very high fat started to get into too much saturated fat. And genetically, I don't do well with the saturated fat on my toolbox genomics. I had to go to carbohydrates. Now, I gained a couple of pounds, two, three pounds, nothing major, but I felt better. I mean, I was gassing. Everybody knows me as the middle-aged energizer bunny rabbit, but I was not the bunny rabbit for a week or two because I was getting too strict with it. So I get it. I do, having tried it, and, and that's what I want to say. I don't recommend something to my patients that I don't try in my office also. So if you guys have any questions, always reach out and ask. Um, some of the newer things that are coming out in reference to the ketogenic diet, it's interesting uh, getting into ketosis, something like a fast mimicking diet and these different things. They eat less calories, and by eating less calories, some of them are, th are enabling you to throw you into ketosis. Doing a lot of work, a lot of research on that. A couple of patients are trying very low-calorie diets. I personally don't like low-calorie diets. I think we need a certain amount of calories, but my takeaway there is it's not about calories, it's all about chemicals. Um, we talked about it, if it uh, comes from a plant, you can eat it. If it's made in a plant, don't eat it. All those kind of pithy little uh, remarks. So um, I'm just going to hit everybody with a like. I haven't seen too many questions, and that's all cool. I hope that um, you guys have some questions that i answer a little later. As always, we're about at the 22-minute mark. It's been my pleasure. I hope to see you guys all in the future. Tomorrow, the next day, we try and do one every day, Monday through Wednesday. It's a lot. And I appreciate your support. And thank you once again. Like, comment, please share it. Hope to see you soon. Dr. Rob, always yours in health.